Uh, so go ahead and share my screen so you can all see. So we're excited to present today on thinking outside of the in-person box. I'm Nikki Kendrick and Maria Gibler is my colleague. We work together at the Utah State University Dietetic Internship and we want to talk about the things that we learned and things that we did um, that helped us think outside of the in-person box during COVID. So a little background about our program. We are a supervised practice program. We're a post-baccalaureate program for students who are training to become dietitians. And our internship is the final step before they can take the credentialing exam to become a dietitian. And we have a combination of the supervised practice where they're in real world settings, and then also some didactic coursework that they complete. We are accredited with the Accreditation Council for Education in Nutrition and Dietetics. And so we have to follow those requirements um, for competencies, education standards uh, for our students. And our students must demonstrate competency in all of those things before they can finish the program. They're also required to complete a minimum of 1200 hours of supervised practice. So that's another thing that we work with. Our program is a distance program and we have over 60 students across the country every year where it's 30 weeks long and most, finish, most students finish in about eight months. And um, about a third of our students are in the state of Utah. We work with over 150 different hospitals, school districts, um, various clinics and community organizations throughout the year. And sometimes I think it's probably higher than 150. I was being a little conservative. And our students complete the program asynchronously because they are spread out across the country and they're working with volunteer preceptors. Um, we allow the preceptors to kind of set the schedule for the students. Each of the faculty has um, experience in the, in the career field before coming to the university. We have one other faculty member. She's actually the dietetic internship director. And so the three of us run this, uh, this program. And the last thing that I will mention is that throughout the presentation, we will probably use the terms, um, well, we won't probably, we will use the terms intern and student interchangeably. So when we say intern or student, we're still talking about the same group. So with COVID, in March of 2020, about 10 of our 60 interns had finished the program or were close to finishing. They had one or two weeks left. And so the other 50 were displaced from their rotations. And overnight, we as the faculty had to take on the responsibility of um, helping our students finish this program, even though they couldn't go back to all of the sites that they were supposed to. Um, we There was a part of me that kind of wanted to like hope for the best, wait and see, maybe they'll be able to go back. And it just became very clear that that was not going to happen. So there were maybe five that were able to stay working with their preceptors um, in a virtual setting. So we didn't have to do as much for them, um, but the rest of them, their preceptors pretty much said, you know, I need to focus on my job. COVID is affecting the hospital, the clinic, wherever they were working, they, and they just didn't have the, the bandwidth to continue working with an intern. We had a lot of those interns who were planning on finishing in April or May or June, and all of a sudden we're just looking at a complete standstill. So the DI faculty worked for a couple of weeks, um, revamping nearly all of our curriculum um, and creating new assignments to keep these students moving forward so they could still meet those competencies that they needed to in order to finish the program. We were concerned because they were facing financial hardship. Our program is unpaid. And so they were looking at, you know, they had planned for about eight or nine months of unpaid work. And now they were looking at even more because they wouldn't be able to finish their program. And the last thing that I'll mention is those asynchronous schedules. So because our students complete these on their own schedules, we essentially had 50 different schedules to work with. Um, we had to find virtual preceptors to work with people, other people we had to find projects for them to do. And so it was a lot of work to come up with nearly 50 different um, schedules for, for all of our students. Maria, you're muted. Thank you. Yep. Um, as Nikki said, um, we had these goals for our interns pre-COVID. Um, and now that COVID hit, we wanted to maintain the goals that still existed. Uh, we knew that we had requirements to fill. 
people. And connection is also very important to us, very important prior to the pandemic. We did so by keeping in touch with our interns um, via email and phone primarily. Um, and because of the distance format, that connection is important. We want our, we want our interns to feel like they have um, a resource and, and someone that they can turn to. Um, so that individualized support is very important. Uh, we always want to follow best practices. And now that our preceptors um, are dealing also with the pandemic, some of them continue to work with our students. We acted as preceptors um, part of the time when we couldn't work with our, our normal preceptors, but we still had professionals who were working with our, our interns and due to the, the pandemic, they needed extra support and guidance too. And so we, um, we knew that we had to maintain all of these things, even though we were um, in the middle of a pandemic. So what did we do? We really had to take a hard look at what our assignments were like. Um, and I think the take home message that we realized is we shifted away from strict adherence to assignment guidelines and we moved to more meaningful alternative projects. Not that our assignments lacked meaning, meaning before COVID, but when you're in a situation like this, it's an opportunity to really hone in on what you're doing and ask questions. Are these assignments what they need to be? Do adjustments need to take place? And so we got rid of the weeds um, or the details that could trip up progress to best outcomes. I do wanna say, and I'm um, from this point, um, after this slide, I'm going to talk about those projects. But I do want to mention that the logistics remained. So we had um, well thought out projects and assignments that our interns completed. And, and the, the, the core, the meat of those um, assignments were still there, just on a smaller scale and sometimes adjusted. There are three areas in our internship that our interns have to demonstrate competency in, and they are food service management, community, and the clinical setting. And I will discuss assignments for each of those, and I'll start with food service management. I, I chose, we have several assignments, but I chose um, three for food service management to discuss today. And the first one that I wanted to talk about is the leadership and management assignment that our interns do when they are in the food service setting. So our emphasis in the dietetic internship for U Utah State University is school nutrition, school foods. So our interns go into schools instead of a hospital setting, they're in a school kitchen. There is an assignment where they take on a leadership and management role where they actually work with employees to lead and to demonstrate management. Um, it has to be a realistic assignment. Um, and so they, worked with their, they work with their preceptors to determine what that would be, but they are interacting in that type of position. Well, they weren't in schools right now, and so we had to give them something else to do. Because, and Nikki mentioned this, because we as dietitians, the faculty at Utah State University um, worked in the field prior to becoming um, faculty, we had experiences to draw upon. And for me, I was an administrative dietitian at Primary Children's Medical Center in Salt Lake City. And um, I had a management role. And one of the things that we were regularly trained on was crucial conversations because we had them so frequently. And often these skills, like you have to have the skill set, but unless you're trained, you really can miss out on some key details that can set you up for success. And so we decided to utilize this resource and have our interns become more proficient in having really difficult conversations. So we had them read the book they completed questions and watched some videos on some um, you know, examples of 
not so great crucial, crucial conversations on how things could be adjusted. And then we provided them with some role playing scenarios and paired them up with the body so they could practice. We brought everyone back together and had a group discussion uh, via WebEx to talk about what they had learned. And then finally, our interns, we asked them to create a 20 minute training on crucial conversations on the key concepts and then teach that. And that just sort of solidified what they learned and gave them the opportunity to verbalize, verbalize those things. Uh, so they realized what they learned too. This was fun. They The feedback was positive. Um, they applied them with the scenarios we gave them, but also in personal situations. So it became quite real for them. And um, it turned out to be a, a successful project. Two other projects I'll mention here. I love these pictures, the, the picture of the pretzels. Um, that is one of my interns. She is in Philadelphia. And one of our uh, assignments in food service management is to do a taste panel. And so when you're not on location, you take it home. So we asked our interns to do a taste panel at home where they had to uh, develop a scoring sheet. They had to um, provide something that they made and it needed to be evaluated and feedback needed to be returned. And so um, this particular intern was a great example of this. Um, as I said, she is in Philadelphia and Philadelphians are known for soft pretzels and they, um, they take pride in their critiquing. And so Morgan um, made soft pretzels. She has a, a, a culinary background um, and she brought over some friends who she termed as foodies. They were distanced and masked. <laughs> she, she made sure that uh, I knew that, but um, she made this great recipe, paired them with some different sauces and then obtained feedback on the soft pretzel. So it was, it was meaningful for her, it was fun for her, but there again, like the logistics were there as far as all of the components that are necessary um, to, to um, develop and to receive feedback on this taste panel. The last um, assignment I'll discuss for this is a plate waste study. Uh, food waste is a huge problem nationally and in the schools. And so we ask our interns to look at plate waste in the schools. Because they weren't able to be there in person, there again, we asked them to take this home. And so what they did was they evaluated their own um, plate waste. First, we asked them to look at some resources to familiarize themselves with the problem of food waste in America. And so we gave them um, several resource to, resources to look at and then to take note on um, what, what some of the core problems were. And then we asked them to keep a log of their personal food waste for three to four days. After that, they identified two personal patterns that contributed to food waste, whether that was over or under ripened produce, portions that were too large or lack of planning. After they did that, they identified two areas of improvement and then two ways that they could implement these um, methods to de decrease food waste. I think if all of us did that, we would have greater insight as to what is contributing to this larger problem. And we found that, our, that this um, assignment for our students did exactly that and was quite meaningful. The second area um, that our interns go into rotation um, is the community setting. And this provides them with the opportunity to connect with resources um, and opportunities for dietitians to contribute in these settings. Um, and so, we ask our interns to go to WIC clinics, women, infants, and children, um, where our nutrition expertise is applied with moms and kids. Um, in the community setting, our interns also can visit food pantries and, and other resources that provide support for people. So 
because they were not in the clinic setting, because they weren't at WIT clinics, because they weren't in food pantries, um, there again, they had to take some of these learning opportunities home. And so what we did was one example is we put together a breastfeeding module. When an intern goes into the WIT clinic, um, they, they talk with moms about breastfeeding. And when they come out of their undergraduate programs, often they don't have great training in this area. And so developing this module for them um, provided them with actually additional knowledge um, so they could go into a setting like this and have some groundwork. So they, they, um, they completed a breastfeeding module which gave them the ins and outs of the basics of breastfeeding, troubleshooting problems, how to talk with moms. And we added some creativity there um, to help engagement like read these or participate in this, you know, these educational videos, put everything away. And then for one minute, time yourself, write down everything that you've learned that you didn't know before. So we tried to get out of the box of just reading and get, we gave them some ideas to um, increase engagement with their learning. Quickly um, going over two of the other projects, we provided our interns with scenarios to counsel. And we as faculty, counseled with them. Um, we met over Zoom and um, gave them the opportunity to counsel one another and then um, receive faculty feedback. And so this provided them with scenarios that they would actually see in clinical settings like the WIC clinic, um, but they were able, because they weren't there, they were able to practice with one another and then have faculty participation. Um, Lastly, our interns were able to put together menus and some real life um, resources that would apply in the community setting and that actually could be used um, for, for the professionals who are already there. But if that wasn't the case now, they could be used at a later date. Okay. Um, our outpatient and long-term care um, areas fall under the clinical umbrella. And clinical is one area in the internship that we had to be very careful with. We couldn't replace a lot of the assignments with virtual assignments. Our interns need to be on site for their clinical competencies. They're working in hospitals with professionals, seeing patients and charting. And for those things, we, we really couldn't replace. But there are two aspects of clinical that we could modify with the virtual platform. And those areas were outpatient and long-term care. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Our preceptors could work. We found preceptors. We networked across the, the nation to find um, preceptors in these settings who could work with our students virtually. And we actually, because of this, now have a greater expansion of professionals that we work with, that we go to um, when we need help for our interns and vice versa. So we have really um, enlarged that um, area of networking. So we had these professionals, they were so willing to work with us and they worked with our students virtually focusing on counseling real patients or with practice scenarios. Um, they were able to teach them some of the ins and outs of how to identify what's go what is actually going on with patients and then how to help them. And so these, these are just a few examples of how we made virtual learning work in the clinical setting. All right, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the other things that we worked on during COVID to make this um, process go smoothly. Um, as Maria mentioned, we had a lot of virtual pre preceptors who worked with our interns virtually. They weren't virtual preceptors because that means they're not real. Um, so they were preceptors who worked with us virtually. And so we put together a document. We worked on this with a couple other um, internship programs, but this is something that we sent out to all of our interns and all of our preceptors. And what we found is that with this, with the transition of going from face to face and needing to do things um, virtually or remotely was that this was 
new to everyone. And so everybody needed some guidance. And so a little bit of the time, it felt like the blind leading the blind. Um, but we still felt like there were some basic guidelines that we could give. And so the first one was that in that preparation area was just setting expectations, um, talking to the preceptors about what do you want to get out of this, working with this intern, and then talking with the students, what do you want to get out of this, and then encouraging them to communicate about those things. Um, also talking about what the internship expected um, from both sides of the agreement. We also talked about, you know, the importance of a daily schedule, and this is really important for our interns, you know, they're used to getting up, getting ready, driving somewhere, and then working all day, but now they were going to be at home working at a computer. Some of our interns um, are married, they have children, some of them are single and live alone, others um, live with roommates and may not have you know, a lot of private space. So this was really important that we discuss this with them so that they could set up a good place for them, um, them to keep all their belongings, to make it so it was a quiet workspace. And then we also talked with preceptors about planning experiences um, and really thinking outside of the box of typical things that are kind of exciting that, you know, it's like interns are going to be really excited about this, but what are some other things that are going to um, be beneficial for them to develop those skills so that they're ready to work once they finish the internship? We also talked about communication and we really strongly encouraged daily communication by phone, email or video chat, whatever was um, convenient for them. Um, a lot of people prefer to do email because it's fast and, and you can do it really quick without um, taking too much time out of your day. But connection was really important to us, maintaining that connection um, on our side as the faculty, but also encouraging the preceptors to also have that connection with their, with their intern. So we, we did ask if most of it was by email, at least a few times a week, they did something over video chat or over the phone um, because interns wanna hear that feedback. They wanna know what they're doing well, what they can improve upon, and they wanna have those conversations. And that really leads to you know, better professional skill development. And then um, with ideas that we included in this document that we shared with everybody was um, to share the students, share the interns with other people. Um, there are probably other people in the organization that have some big projects. A lot of people's job responsibilities changed with COVID and we, most of us had more things added, very few things were taken away from our responsibilities. And so those students are eager to work, they wanna be involved. And so we encourage them to say, you know, if you don't have something for that student to work on, go ahead and see if there's somebody else who can work with your intern for the day or who can give them a project that might take them a few days to work on. Uh, we also talked about virtual trainings. So are there trainings or webinars that the preceptor would normally participate in and can we get the intern involved in that? And then the last one was those rainy day projects, those big projects that you want to do, but you don't always have the right resources. Interns love to take those things on. It allows them to be creative and they bring a different spin on it because they're younger um, and they, they can show you new technologies, things like that. So these are all of the things that we shared with our preceptors and that we encouraged our interns to talk about so that it was a good experience for everyone. We've talked a lot about some of the successes as Maria talked about the examples of what we changed in our curriculum and the alternative activities that we had our students do. Um, but I just wanted to highlight a couple more um, or a few more. So the outpatient and counseling and consulting opportunities. A lot of dietitians, um, once they finish their internship and start working, are really interested in private practice and consulting. And so this was a really great um, success for us because we were able to connect our interns with so many different people. These dietitians are running their own business and doing the nutrition counseling. And that was really exciting for our interns. Um, some of them had very specific um, practice areas that they worked in, whether it was weight management or intuitive eating, or some of them were like feeding dynamics with families. And so interns got to see a lot more than they would if we had just sent them to the usual places that we would um, use for the internship. And Maria has one example that she just wanted to share of the success of, of this, pro of how we did this. Um, I had a, an intern who worked with a preceptor in a virtual setting, <laughs> and um, she, were, this preceptor has her own business, Applied Dietetics, and my intern Alexi, I am just going to quote from one of the um, weekly reports that our interns send us, and I just loved her enthusiasm, and it really did um, portray how, how this worked for her. 
She said, I worked on a variety of tasks with Chrissy this week. On my first day, she went over a detailed plan with me regarding projects and tasks she had developed for me over the next three weeks. We went over assignments together. She was aware of what I needed to complete and what she could help me with. Projects that I'm working for her, uh, projects that I'm working on for her include developing her social media page, creating a local physician office directory, educational handouts, observing counseling calls, reviewing patients' food diaries, writing up assignments telehealth billing, coding module, and a few other tasks. So that's a lot, but the, but the variety there is fantastic. And then just one last quote that she said, I also can't believe that one person is able to do all of this work by herself. So it provided her with insight on what it takes to run your own business, the topics, not only the topics that you address as a dietitian, but things like creating physician directories and getting your social media up and um, billing. I mean, that's all part of it. So relationships with a preceptor across the country, but really great opportunities for our interns and this intern in particular. Okay, so case study discussions. This is one that um, I took the lead on. And um, Maria didn't mention earlier, but when we did the WIC counseling, she took the lead on that. And I think she counseled almost all 50 of our interns or counseled with all 50 of our interns. She spent a lot of time with that. These case study discussions were um, something that I put together using patient scenarios that I had collected over the years and then um, sent those out to the students who needed some clinical experience but weren't going to be able to go back to the hospital for a long time or for an undefined time period. And so we wanted to make sure that they stayed connected and engaged with the with the content of the internship and so that their skills didn't deteriorate over time. And so we had them complete this case study and then we came back together um, and had a, a class discussion about what they decided and they were able to really think about their clinical judgment as they were read through the case study what did they identify as the patient's nutrition problems what would they do for the plan for this patient and they could hear from their classmates like oh well i thought this was most important or i thought this was most important and it really helped them develop some more skills that were valuable once they were able to go back to the hospital and this is something that was pretty simple as far as like time commitment on my part um, you know, I spent an hour to an hour and a half in these classes and I, I did just a few of them, but uh, it was such an overwhelmingly positive response from our students of how much they enjoyed it. And I think they enjoyed it because it helped them stay connected. They got to communicate with their classmates more and they had more um, interaction with one another. And they also got to, you know, have conversations with faculty. And that was something they were really missing as they were waiting to be able to go back to the hospital. Um, Maria has just one quick example to share of another kind of case study thing that we did that was really successful. We partnered with another dietitian in Pennsylvania um, who is a WIC director. And this, this has just been fantastic for us because I feel like we are true partners. They know who we are. We email and say, hey, can you work with a student? And it's just, it's almost a natural process now. The nice thing about this partnership is not all WIC directors are dietitians, but this WIC director is a dietitian. Uh, she's a PhD dietitian. And so our interns, because they got to work with her, had additional insight into the role and were able to incorporate that dietitian perspective. Um, Linda did a great job with our interns. She gave them things to work on, some teaching opportunities with some complex topics like um, breastfeeding babies with cleft palate or hydrocephalus. So it just was a step above what um, might actually take place even if a student was um, on site in a facility. And the last thing I think is pretty obvious from the discussions that were the things that we've shared already is that this was a really great opportunity for our interns to build their professional network. We built our professional network as faculty, but the interns also did this as they worked one on one with these different preceptors. They worked with people that they never would have come in contact with. I had an intern in Washington working with a dietitian in Texas. I had another intern here in Utah working with a dietitian in Washington, DC. And those were just really great connections for them to make. All right, so to kind of tie all this together, what did we learn? Um, 
one of the biggest takeaways that the faculty had was that some of our curriculum was just more didactic didactic than necessary in an internship supervised practice type of program. So we were able to take a look at, you know, these are all the projects we said our interns needed to do in the past, and this is what they had to turn in to prove that they had met the competencies and for us to really track everything. But is that actually showing and giving them um, good experience? And so one of the one example that comes to my mind is, you know, we used to have them do a research project and then write a paper. Um, it was an eight to 10 page research paper on how their research project went. When we thought about that, it's like, yes, you might write a report on a project that you do um, in your job, but more than likely you're going to give a presentation or you're going to give a, a short you know, brief, like maybe two pages to an administrator to help fund a program or advocate for funding a program. So we um, adjusted the expectations of what they were going to submit to prove that they had learned and had developed these skills. We also learned that um, our students are capable of leading their own learning when they're given parameters. So we really focused on, you know, these are the expectations of this project or of this rotation. Um, what do you think you can do or what do you wanna learn um, so that you can demonstrate, demonstrate these skills? And we were able to um, help those students and they were actually better than we thought at um, directing their own learning. Um, Another one was our students were able to develop a lot of resilience. This was really tough. And we all know that COVID has been really difficult on everyone. And our interns really handled the situations of, you know, rotations canceled or delays. Um, and they just, they handled it. They, they understood what was going on, um, but they really developed some self-confidence as they were forced to, you know, work independently on projects and really stay on top of their learning on their own. Um, some interns who weren't maybe very good at self-motivation um, were a lot better at it by the time they finished the internship because of those challenges of COVID. Um, as faculty, we realized that there were a lot of resources that we used in our careers before we came to the internship that were valuable educational tools. So a few of them that we used were from the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, which I know is a mouthful. That's one that I used in the hospital setting. Um, Maria used different things with food service and um, our other colleague used um, a few other things in her community and outpatient practice that we were able to share with our students. And then the last one, we've talked about this a little bit, but communicating with our students regularly and frequently really led to success. And it's something that we have continued throughout this year. Um, it's really important to us to um, have some extra meetings, things that are really informal that allow the students to come together to talk to one another, to talk to us. And that has um, led to a lot of engagement and relationship development. Mentoring relationships are stronger because of that. Hey guys, I hate to interrupt. The conversation is great. Um, I just wanted to give a quick reminder. We have about two minutes left. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So this is our last slide. Progress takes place outside the comfort zone. This is something that we tell about all of our interns is that the magic happens when you step outside your comfort zone. There's lots of plays on this, um, this comment, but this, we really feel that we took a step outside of our comfort zone. And hopefully um, some of the things that we've shared today, maybe they don't directly apply to what you do, um, but maybe they have sparked some ideas for you to think about um, what you could do for your students in the future. And with the time we have left, I know it's not much, but we're happy to take any questions. And I saw Maria put um, the, our emails in the chat box so you can reach out to us as well. Thank you for joining us today, all of those who participated. Awesome, and thank you, Maria and Nikki. That was a great presentation, and we're so glad we we're able to have you here. Um, we can just have everyone hop off now. Um, like they said, their emails are in the chat, so feel free to contact them. And I hope you guys all enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.